The people stood by and watched. The rulers, meanwhile, sneered at him and said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. Even the soldiers jeered at him. As they approached to offer him wine, they called out, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Above him there was an inscription that read, This is the king of the Jews. Now one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other, however, rebuking him, said in reply, Have you no fear of God? For we are subject to, we, you are subject to the same condemnation, and indeed we have been condemned justly, for the sentence that we received corresponds to our crimes. But this man has done nothing criminal. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied to him, Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good evening, everyone. We continue our Lenten journey, our meditation, on the seven last words of Jesus tonight, focusing on the second word. But before I get into that, I'd like to share a quick story with you. There is a legend to the effect that when, to whom escaped the wrath of Herod, St. Joseph and the Blessed Virgin were fleeing into Egypt with the Divine Child. They stopped at a desert inn. The Blessed Mother asked the Lady of the Inn for water in which to bathe Jesus. The Lady then asked if she might not bathe her own child, who was suffering from leprosy, in the same waters in which that Divine Child would be immersed. Immediately upon touching the waters, the baptized with the Divine Presence, the child with leprosy became clean. Her child advanced in age and grew to be a thief. That thief's name was Dismas. Dismas would be one of the two who would hang on the cross with Christ. That reflection comes from Fulton Sheen's seven last words, and it opens our thoughts on the importance of this second word from the cross. And it's not so much what was said, but it is the fact that it is one of the few dialogues we see in the Passion. St. Dismas, the good thief, enters into dialogue with his fellow criminal and then with Jesus. But before we do this, we need to look at why Jesus, why Dismas rather, opened his mouth. These are three men who have been placed upon an instrument of torture. They are suffocating greatly. It, you, crucifixion is death by asphyxiation or suffocation. You try to save every breath you have when you're on the cross. Why would Dismas use the few breaths that he had? Not only to ask God for mercy, but to rebuke the other criminal. Well, let's take a look at what we just read. The people stood by and said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. This notion of saving occurs in this passage from Luke at least four times alone. And they call for Jesus to save himself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross, prove to us that you're the Son of God, save yourself. Well, we all know that Jesus did anything but that. By not coming down from the cross, he saved them. Because it is his, through his death that we attain eternal life. So the people who are asking Jesus to save himself don't realize that if he did that, they would have no means of salvation. Point one. The chief priests and the rulers refer to Jesus as the chosen one. They do so in an attempt to mock him. But yet again, they have no clue who Jesus is. Jesus is the chosen one. And we're going to hear how chosen Jesus is this coming Sunday in the gospel that we have for the second Sunday of Lent. Always the same gospel. 
and that is the Gospel of the Transfiguration, where we see the divinity of Jesus declared. And this is my chosen one. We hear the voice from the cloud saying, this is the one I choose. This is my son. So in essence, their term of mockery was actually the correct term to call him. The Roman soldiers would refer to Jesus as the king of the Jews, and this title came simply from Pilate's interpretation of what the soldiers actually referred to Jesus as. It is believed that as Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem carrying the cross to Calvary, this title, here is the king of the Jews, written by Pilate himself, was carried before him as a label and then finally placed above his cross. Again, an attempt to ridicule would become the essence of our salvation, for Jesus is our King. So with all of these things swirling around the pain and the agony of three men on the cross, these criminals, who by the way were not up there for robbery, they were up there for much worse crimes, began to chime in and rebuke Jesus. And one of them says, are you not the Messiah? Are you not the chosen one? Are you not the Son of God? If you are the king of the Jews, save us and yourself. Prove to these people that they're doing something wrong. One criminal mocks Jesus. Dismas, the only named criminal, would rebuke the mockery. Dismas confesses to Jesus that their sins caused them to be on the cross, and Jesus did nothing to deserve to be there. But in Dismas's moment of conversion, he sees Jesus' love for him and for those who put him on the cross. And he sees that this love was so great that he announces Jesus' innocence, as Pilate would do three times in Luke's Gospel before condemning Jesus to death for fear of riot. Dismas then addresses Jesus directly, dialogue between our Lord and a sinner. And he begs and pleads with him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Dismas's plea for recognition of his conversion is equal to the, his moment of opportunity for salvation. Because Jesus' answer, the final time the Lord would use amen before a statement affirming its validity, Jesus would say, Amen, I say to you, today, this moment, right now, in this point of conversion, you will be with me in paradise. So for you and for me, who hear this moment of conversion, say, well, how do we work with this? How does can this moment of conversion apply to our lives? Dismas's moments of conversion gives us a three-stepped approach to conversion of our own hearts. First, to rebuke the voice of the enemy. Dismas began his conversion by rebuking, rebuking the other criminal. The word of rebuking translated in our gospel comes from the Greek word epithemao, which basically means not just to rebuke, but to rebuke one that is more powerful than you. That is the rebuking that Dismas did. The rebuking that Dismas did, and that we see in the Gospels, who is often rebuked, is the devil. We who were called as a church last week to rebuke in last week's Gospel, do we not forget the story of the temptation of Jesus? How many times did Jesus rebuke the devil? Three times. Each time telling him, get behind me, get away from me, get away and stay away. The devil wants to oppose every aspect of our life with the Lord. And the voice that mocked our Lord and said, if you are the Son of God, come down from this cross, is the same voice that taunted Jesus in the desert. Notice the phrase, if you are the Son of God. It was mentioned three times in the Gospel of Temptation. It returns in a completely different Gospel before our Lord's Passion. Tell me that's not coincidence. For the other criminal, in attacking Christ's divine sonship, he echoed the voice of Satan, and thus that voice deserves to be turned away. The first step in true repentance for each of us 
is to rebuke the voice of the devil in our own lives. This is the voice that does everything it can to prevent us from turning away from sin and turning towards God's mercy. We all know it. It's that nagging voice of pride, self-condemnation, laziness, self-centeredness. This voice can discourage us and force us to focus on the things that turn us from God, which makes us seem to be living our faith better than other Christians, that we think that there are others around us that are better than we are, therefore we are failures in the eyes of God, and the sin that we commit is something that God does not necessarily take to heart. This voice can push us to despair, getting us to think that we can never overcome our weaknesses. We can never overcome our sins and addictions, and that we should just give up the battle because the fight is not worth fighting. This voice can also push us to rationalize our sins, getting us to justify the wrong that we're doing. Oh, I didn't do anything that bad. It's not that big of a deal. I only did it once. Nobody will notice. I'm not that bad of a person, am I? The voice of the evil one. Rebuke it. Turn away from it, because that voice tries to silence our conscience and keep us from admitting our sin and turning back to God. The next time you find yourself discouraged about your weaknesses, remind yourself the devil is a liar and he will try to trick you at every point in your journey with God. Rebuke him and do it today, as Dismas did. The second step is to name your sin. When we rebuke the accusing and the rationalizing voices, we don't have to hide behind anything anymore. Our sin has come to light. We face it in the, our failures and failures head on, and we face it with the love of God. We admit them, we name them, and we own them. That is why the sacrament of reconciliation, my dear brothers and sisters, is so liberating, but also why it can be intimidating. It forces us to be totally authentic and vulnerable before the priest, before God, and before ourselves. The sacrament forces us to face the honest truth about ourselves. And only when we are open, and when we open ourselves to God's mercy, and make ourselves vulnerable before the open heart of His mercy, can we experience the healing encouragement to get up and try again, and His healing grace to get, help us to be better next time. Dismas, in his dying moments on the cross, comes to this realization in his heart and opens himself not only in his physical vulnerability, but opens himself to the fountain of divine mercy. He knocks on the door of the heart of the divine physician and begs for the penicillin of God's mercy to cure the ailments of pride and self-doubt. Finally, we entrust ourselves to the mercy of God. Having admitted his sins, this good thief then does something no one else, the Gospels, ever does. He addresses Jesus by his name. No one else addressed Jesus by name. He did. Jesus, remember me. Have mercy on me when you come into your kingdom. Others attach titles to the Lord's name, Messiah, Son of David, Master. But this intimacy that we see in this moment of suffering from the cross is remarkable, especially given the fact of where this man spiritually was only a few hours before. He was a thief, not willing to see the fault of his own sin. In the final moments of his life, he recognized that his sin on earth and not redeeming himself from those would cause him greater pain than what he was experiencing on the cross. This is how you and I are called to address Jesus, to make this bold request in faith, and we, like the good thief, will receive more mercy than we ever wanted. All Dismas wanted was for Jesus to remember him. Jesus offered him something greater than he could ever ask for, paradise. He promised him today that he would be with him in paradise. This second word, my dear brothers and sisters, and this dialogue that we meditate on reminds us that it is never too late to turn to the Lord with our sins. Our past does not have to define who we are. And no matter what we have done, and no matter how long we have been away, the Lord is waiting for us, 
and like the good thief, we may find more is waiting for us there than we can expect. In this season of Lent, I encourage you to avail yourselves to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. As you know, every Saturday morning we have the Sacrament available from 9 to 10. For those who are willing to go this evening, I will stick around for a few extra minutes for anyone who wishes to avail themselves this evening. But if you're not ready for that sacrament yet, take time and prepare yourself and make yourself available to this beautiful moment of grace, this dialogue with God, your heart to the heart of Jesus, the divine Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Bestow on us, we pray, O Lord, a spirit of always pondering on what is right and of hastening to carry it out. And since without you we cannot exist, may we be enabled to live according to your will. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.